did last time. We walk down here and then that's it. Ooh. At the end of August in the year 2022, four Rattray sons of Peter Rattray visit Downey Park. Downey Park in Angus was built by William Rattray, the fifth son and twelfth of 13 children born to James Rattray of Culloden and his wife Jean Kinlock. William is our three times great uncle. William Rattray was born in 1759. He entered the Bengal army as a cadet, rising through the ranks. By 1796, the Bengal army had three battalions of European infantry, three battalions of European artillery. One of these battalions was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William Rattray. There were 10 native regiments of cavalry and 12 infantry. William Rattray retired in 1798. Around the back, I think, right? Well. Yep. In this video, we'll not only explore William's house and grounds, but also what he was doing in India. Were the stables built at the same time? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yep. He doesn't need a carriage of things, doesn't he? And when do, when do you think this was built? 17? 18 something. Okay. 18... 1801? Yeah. Something. Okay, very early. Yeah. And why here? Why not Blegauri way? Because the, they went there, didn't they? They went to... Buy back running other than Yeah, there was the famous... Uh, 12,000 12, 12, yeah. guineas. Yeah. 12, guineas so. yeah. But um, this but is such a long way from there. No, this, this is um, uh, it's Kinloch land. This is Kinloch. His mother was a Kinloch. So they oh. were buying back Kinloch land. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, his mother was Jean Kinloch. I knew it was Jean Kinloch. Okay. And also his, his wife was his cousin. Was and his father Kinloch. served in the Ogilvy Regiment. This courtly castle. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't realise it as far over as the... Yeah. Regarding the 12,000 guineas, it refers to the family estate of Ranagallion and Corb, which was sold in 1771 by their father, James Rattray of Culloden. William and James, his brother, offered 12,000 pounds when 12,000 guineas was asked. No purchase was made. Instead, William bought Downey Park and James bought Arthurston Estate near Meagle, which once belonged to their mother's family. William Rattray married his cousin when he got back from India. In common with many in India at that time, William had an Indian partner, companion or bibi. We'll talk more about this later. So can, what can you tell us about the stables? The design or whatever, do you know anything about that? Uh, not particularly, not really, but he, he's supposed to put a lot of his, uh, a lot of the Rattray crests. I'm oh, not really? sure if he put it on buildings, but he put it on a lot of his on possessions. Okay. So there is a, always a chance that there is a crest somewhere. It's very Chairs. unusual shape, isn't it? In the it's book the door, Georgian the Architecture of Scotland, John Dunbar says the large stables are connected to the house by a stretch of lawn allowing the riding of the horse right up to the door. The stables contain at least 10 horses and William's coach with the right trace crest emblazoned on the side. So why was William Rattray in India? For us to talk about this we need to go back to the very beginning and understand how the Europeans first got to India. The Portuguese in Vasco da Gama discovered a sea route around Africa in 1495 to the east and India. 100 years later are the European nations and the Dutch joined in. English merchants could see a lucrative trade they were not part of. So on the 31st of December 1600, Elizabeth I gave the London merchants a charter that allowed them to trade with the east. The company they formed was called the East India Company. It was a time when merchant ships required to be armed. They carried cannons to defend themselves. Despite this, in the seven years between 1609 and 1616, 466 English ships were attacked by Barbary Muslim galleys from North Africa and their crews were taken away as slaves.
because we saw visitors. Have you seen that? Is that? David's saying there's a replica of this at Bratra Percy's build. Uh, uh, yeah. Charles Wedderburn. Yeah. He, uh, Dr. David Rattray, his daughter, yeah. Elizabeth married him. Wedderburn was the son of the person that was in the Newgate That's jail. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is only, this is probably three or four miles away. Oh. Exactly, exactly the same, Ooh. almost exactly the is that, same. What is that? Percy? Percy, yeah. Ah. <laughs> I saw the sign up first. Yeah, we yeah. saw it, yeah. So, yeah. so tell us what's happened there. She's reproduced the same house? Uh, yes, his nephew-in-law basically used, I guess, used the same architect. Oh. Did uh, almost exactly the same design. It doesn't have the two two things on either side. It doesn't have the uh, uh, you know the porch type thing. And mm. the, I think the top is slightly different. And do you think he just did it to save money on architects? <laughs> Quite possibly. Yeah. Quite possibly. Yeah. 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 Mm. It's a nice one. I love the I same. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice mm. time. I'll just borrow it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. While the English and Europeans arrived in India from Europe we need to remind ourselves that the great moguls arrived from Central Asia about 16 years after the Portuguese. The moguls were Muslims, the majority of the population of India were Hindus. When the East India Company ships arrived in the early 1600s, the moguls were in power and the East India Company needed permission from the moguls to trade in India. So th this graveyard, is it a consecrated ground? I don't know. How, how do I tell? It's not on a church or anything like no that. Church, no. In those days, just a priest to come and I don't think he was too bothered to tell you the truth. But no, I don't think he was. <laughs> so what was it like for the early English merchants who arrived in India? William Dalrymple tells us in his book White Moguls, this early period of British life in India was a succession of unexpected and unplanned minglings of people and cultures and ideas. Just as an individual Britons in India could appreciate and wish to emulate different aspects of Indian culture and chose to take on Indian manners and languages, also so many Indians at this period began to travel to Britain, intermarrying with locals there and picking up Western ways. So what have you been able to find out about William? I've, his, uh, some of his records are in the National Archive in India. Oh. And so we know he, uh, he, one of his daughters, I got, found out when she was, the captain had to get permission to take her on board for some reason. Okay. Maybe because of her age. Uh, so he had to write to the, the local authorities asking for, for permission for her to be a passenger. To come to this, to come to the UK. Yeah, and then he, he was booked uh, on, on passage with a servant. So I was just wondering whether the servant could have been his other daughter. Oh. Uh. These comments by David about William Routrey and his mixed race daughters made me reflect a bit upon them. I think I may know the reason why mixed race children in the late 1790s had to obtain permission to travel to Britain. But before I go straight to the explanation, it is important to understand the context that led up to these requirements. We need to remind ourselves that neither the East India Company nor the British government ever intentionally set out to colonise India. It was a series of circumstances, starting with the reckless expansion of the Mughal Empire into other areas of India by Emperor Aurangzeb, which led to the collapse. After Aurangzeb's death in 1707, the Mughal Empire became anarchic and chaotic. It resulted in a series of struggles between Indian rulers and states and the remnants of the Mughal Empire. Eventually, the European companies got involved. William Rattray and his two older brothers, James and Alexander, served in the East India Company during the time of its most significant change, from being purely a commercial trading company to one that controlled foreign territory. This is the sequence of events that resulted in this change. The French appointed 
Francois de Pleur as governor of French India. He cherished the ambition of a French Indian territorial empire. In 1756, he encouraged the Nawab of Bengal to attack the British East India trading post at Fort William in Calcutta, which was overrun. This resulted in the 1757 Battle of Plessy, when the British East India troops under Robert Clive decisively defeated the French and the Nawab. That basically ended the French involvement in India. In 1765, the Mughal Emperor granted the East India Company the Diwani or right to collect revenue in Bengal, while control of the civil administration remained with the local Mughal governor. Disaster struck during this period of dual governance in the form of the Great Bengal Famine of 1770. Some estimates say as many as one-third of the population died. The British government was appalled by what was going on and introduced a series of acts through Parliament to tighten the control of the East India Company. As a result, the post of Governor-General with four council members was created. They had overall control of the company's territories, created a system of double government. The Crown had some responsibilities and the East India Company others. In 1786, the company faced accusations of poor governance and appointed a new governor in General Charles Cornwallis. It was a private corporation starting to rule a foreign territory and it was grappling with this new task that it was never set up to do. And I remember reading a passage, William Dalrymple's book, White Moguls, and I went and searched for it. And what I'm going to do now is just read it again because... I think this is the explanation as to why William Rattray had to seek permission to bring his mixed-race daughters to the UK. From 1786, under the new Governor-General, Lord Cornwallis, a whole raft of legislation was brought in excluding the children of British men who had Indian wives from employment by the company. Cornwallis arrived in India from his defeat by George Washington at Yorktown. And that, of course, is the American War of Independence. I just want to stop and discuss this a bit further. What this actually meant is if you had an Indian partner, wife, companion, or as the local Indians call them, BB, your children had absolutely no prospects in the company. If you died, they were not allowed to travel to Britain to be looked after by your own family. I think that's absolutely terrible what happened. And Cornwallis did this because he didn't want a repeat of a loss of a colony as happened with North America. And he wanted to separate the company officials from the local people. And it wasn't done on the basis of race or anything like that. It was just trying to separate the administration so that they didn't have divided loyalties as they had done in North America. But of course, India, unlike the North American colonies, was inhabited by people with very strong cultural differences to the Europeans. Since 1495, when the first Europeans arrived by sea in India, until these measures were put in place, almost 300 years, the European and Indian cultures had mixed freely. I do wonder if the consequences of these measures can still be felt today in Britain, with some people's intolerance of people from different cultures especially those with different skin colouring. Let me continue with the other measures put in place. He was determined to make sure that a settled colonial class never emerged in India to undermine British rule as it had done to his own humiliation in America. With this in mind, in 1786 an order was passed banning the Anglo-Indian orphans of British soldiers from travelling to England to be educated so qualifying for service in the company. In 1791, the door was slammed shut when an order was issued that no one with Indian parents could be employed by the civil, military or marine branches of the company. In 1795, further legislation was passed explicitly disqualifying anyone not descent from European parents on both sides from serving in the company's army except as pipers, drummers, bandsmen and farriers. Yet like their British fathers, 
the Anglo-Indians were also banned from owning land. There is another important point here about land ownership. It appears the East India Company banned Europeans from owning land in India, presumably to protect the local population. Or was it yet again another measure to prevent a European colonial class from developing within a colony? I don't know the answer to this, but one can speculate. Thus excluded from all the most lucrative employment, the Anglo-Indians quickly found themselves at the beginning of a long slide down the social scale. This would continue until a century later and they had been reduced to a community of minor clerks and train drivers. Faced with limited prospects in India, the company's servants, rich enough to send their Anglo-Indian children home and many mixed-blood children who were successfully absorbed into the British upper classes, some even attained high office. Lord Liverpool, the early 19th century Prime Minister, was of Anglo-Indian descent. Captain James Rattray, Lieutenant Alexander Rattray and Lieutenant Colonel William Rattray all joined the East India Company before this new legislation. We can understand what was going on. Dalrymple says there was growing horror at the ever-increasing arrogance and indeed naked racism of the company's government in Calcutta from the late 1790s onwards. So we can see why William was so keen to remove his mixed-race daughters, who I'm sure he loved dearly. Did you find the... I found the, the, the passage request, or the, the booking yeah. request. And he was booked on a, a vessel called the Surprise, and the, it was a convict ship. Oh, right. So it's outward Bernie journey with convicts. To Australia? To Australia. Had a mutiny on board, apparently, on the outward journey, or a near mutiny. Hmm. They had three... They, they were taking convicts, and they, they called them the, the three Scottish martyrs, apparently, out to Australia, and uh, they had some... Uh, the people who were sort of guarding them were uh, there were some Irish deserters who had already deserted, but they were being employed as, <laughs> as jailers. <laughs> and, that and, seems strange. Yeah, it does. And, the, and apparently the convict reported to the <coughs> captain that they were plotting to murder him and uh, mutiny mm. <laughs> in speaking Gaelic. Oh, right. Yeah. So the, obviously the Scottish people who had been convicted and being sent out could speak it as well, and yeah. they heard this uh, the plan. Yeah. Mm. So he... And his and his first officer was involved as well, so he mm. he uh, God. put them in chains apparently. God. Those journeys were a bit more eventful than those. Mm. Yeah. There was only a standard put in for passenger transport <coughs> on seas in 1803. Yeah, so Up until then, they were treated like cargo. Yeah, yeah. The Hindu culture in general proved less accessible to the British than Islam, the Mughal's religion at least partly because many Hindus regarded the British as untouchable, refusing to eat with them, so restricting somewhat the possibilities for social interaction. Technically, it's impossible to convert to Hinduism. To be a Hindu, you must be born a Hindu. James Grant gave a bell to the Durga temple in Benares after the priest there had prayed for his safety when he and his wife and children were caught in a whirlpool in the Ganges, immediately opposite the temple. You don't actually know how he made his money, Dave. Well, we do, uh, because they, in that time they had, they had prize money, same as the Navy, basically. So, um, so all the soldiers would have got... They would have got part of proportionally, depending on their rank, mm. they would have got proportionally whatever was uh, acquired. And of course, his, uh, his older brother, Alexander, was also in the Bengal artillery. Same, same regiment as he was. So if he had prize money, he would have got it, probably got that as well. Because he was killed, did he? He, he died in the South, South China Sea. Uh, and we know he had money because he left money to um, his sister, mm. El Elizabeth Weeks. Mm. She married uh, uh, Sidney Joseph. York, who was a, a quite a famous. I remember Royal seeing Navy. that in her books. Yeah. yeah. And he, he bang he complained a bit because he, he didn't get her diary. Jack <laughs> Rattray of Arthurston hadn't paid out her diary. Huh? Unfortunately, it was on like a spur. Oh, 
In the 18th century, there were three significant events for the Scots and the Rattrays. The first was the dissolution of the English and Scottish parliaments to form the UK Parliament in 1707. Scots were able for the first time to participate in English colonies and trade with the East and India. The second significant event was the end of the Jacobite Wars in 1746 at Culloden. As we will see in William's house, the Rattrays were staunch Jacobites. The final big event that occurred in this century was the disintegration of Mughal rule in India, resulting in a power vacuum where anarchy ruled. The East India directors in London and the British government stressed to their employees not to get involved. Against their wishes, the East India Company was involved in protecting its trading posts against the French and as a result of European wars and local Maharaja Indian rulers. The East India Company in the mid-18th century raised its own army. The combination of these events resulted in James Rattray of Culloden's three sons going to India in the late 18th century. This flood, this look at the drop. That, this is probably where the flooding is coming up. Oh, yeah. I see. Well, his two daughters were died before him, and then when he was in, in or buried here, they dug up the remains of his two daughters <clears> and buried them with him. William Rattray chose his burial site on the banks of the river. Downey Park is up here. I'm just going to read a short piece that was written regarding this grave site. A decade after Rattray's death, after a prolonged rain and thunder, the swollen rivers overflowed their banks. The Prosen ran red and furiously in the Hoch at Downey Park, and entering the sacred enclosure where the colonel was buried, and swirling round inside of the enclosed wall, scooped open a large portion of the grave. The people of the district thought and said strange things on the subject, as if some Indian mystery had been connected with this garrulous act of the person. The, the account says he was buried under the, a stone of a, an ancient warrior with high, higher griffs on the side. Oh. So it's probably a Pictish. Okay, yeah, so he's yeah. probably buried underneath uh, one of those Pictish carvings. Yeah. Very interesting. What's in there, Hugh? Um, Not very much. Just broken wood and things, you know, trees, including tree stumps and trees that obviously grown in here as well. Looks like it might have had a plaque in it. To the right. Yeah, just cut. Oh yeah. So that might have been the plaque on the inside of this grave. So we've seen the grave site where he's first buried, and we're now racing back because we said we'd meet the lady Rosie, I think her name is, who is cleaning the property at 12 and it's now 5 past 12. James Rattray of Culloden and his wife Jean Kinlock had 13 children, six of which were boys, three of these went to India. Their second son James went to sea at the age of 13 working for the East India Merchant Service starting as the captain's servant then midshipman and working his way up through the ship's officers or mate ranks until finally becoming a captain of an East Indiaman, the three-masted sailing ship. When he was captain of the Gatton, she was captured with five other East Indiamen in the Bay of Biscay on the 9th of August 1780 by combined force of French and Spanish fleets. Their third son, Alexander Rattray, was in the Bengal artillery with his younger brother, William who went on to be Lieutenant Colonel, commanding one of the Bengal Artillery Battalions. In total, 23 Rattrays, 21 of whom I'm shown here, but I'm told by my younger brother there's another two I haven't shown, descended from James Rattray and Jean Kinlock, served in India from 1754, Captain James, to 1948, when Major Peter Hugh Rattray left India and Rear Admiral Sir Arthur Runyon Rattray also left. 
our father, Peter Hugh Rattray, gave, gave command of the 45th Rattray Sikhs to the first native Indian commanding officer. Many of the Rattrays were in various regiments of the Indian Army. One of the more notable Rattrays in this service was Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Rattray, our great-grandfather, who was an infantryman, and he commanded the Viceroy's Cavalry. He was then asked to raise the battalion of Sikhs in 1856. These went on to be known as the 45th Rattray Sikhs, which were commanded by his son Haldane Burney and grandson Peter Hugh Rattray. Notable Rattrays in the Indian judicially were James Rattray and Jean Kinlock's grandson Robert Haldane Rattray, who was Chief Judge of the High Courts of Calcutta in 1827. In the Indian Navy, their great-great-grandson was Rear Admiral Sir Arthur Rullian Rattray. One great-grandson, Lieutenant George Herbert Rattray, died in a duel, a terrible waste of life, especially as his mother died giving birth to him. If you Google James Rattray of Afghanistan, you'll find James Rattray and Jean's great-great-grandson, Captain James Rattray. It was a highly acclaimed paintings of Afghanistan. Going back to try and understand the India that William and his brothers would have known, William Dalrymple says, at all times up to the mid-19th century, there was a wholesale interracial exploration, which was surprisingly widespread. Virtually all Englishmen in India at this period Indianized themselves to some extent. We know William Rattray had three mixed-race daughters, and Dalrymple tells us in the second half of the 18th century, the majority of company servants took an Indian bibi, wife or mistress or companion. The Bengali wills from 1780 to 1785 preserved in the India office, one in three contains a bequest to Indian wives or companions or their natural children. Many contained clauses where British men asked their close friends and family to take care of their Indian partners, referring to them as well-loved, worthy friend or this amicable and distinguished lady. Indian women, for example, introduced British men to the delights of regular bathing. The fact that the word shampoo is derived from the Hindi word for massage. Those who returned home and continued to bathe and shampoo themselves on a regular basis found themselves scoffed at by their less hygienic compatriots. Indeed, it was a cliché at the time that the British in Bengal had become effeminate. There were a number of high-profile marriages between leading Mulvies or Muslim clerics and British women, most of whom converted to Islam. Regarding William Rattray, mixed-race children, there is every indication that he loved them dearly. Sadly, we know very little about their mother, how she died in India. <laughs> William Rattray returned to Britain in 1795 with a letter of support for Warren Hastings. Yeah. Warren Hastings was the first British Governor General for, and controlled Bengal from 1772 to 1785, gone through an impeachment process and had been acquitted. The letter was signed by the officers of the Bengal Army, Colonel and 175 officers and staff, and this must be a small accolade for William to take this letter to Warren Hastings. I also wonder if this letter reflects the sentiment of those in India that things were far better when Warren Hastings was in control compared to the regimes that had followed him. Warren Hastings declared, in truth, I love India a little more than my own country. Seven. Okay, I'll call the cleaning girls out, because we're still kind of COVID-y worried. We start our tour of William Rattray's house from the kitchen. Who would have worked here in the early 1800s? A typical Georgian house would have had five to seven servants. In the kitchen was the cook and the kitchen maid. The cook had enormous responsibilities as the family's health, money and reputation as good hosts were in her hands. Her hours would have been long, but not as long as the maid's. The kitchen maid would usually be about 10 or 11 years old. Her job was to get up early, 
keep adding coal to the fire, making sure that it was permanently alight for heating water, for washing and cooking. The basement corridor is lined with doors leading to rooms such as the wine cellar, china closet, pantry and linen store. Oh, they found the inscription on the yeah. desk. What does it know? Sacred to the memory of departed worth. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel William Ratchet down the park, late in peace. Oh, sorry. Company. That's it. 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 That's Door at this level is the tradesman's entrance for deliveries and the coming and going of servants who are not allowed to use the main front door, which is for the family and their guests. And he's supposed to have had the Chinese cabinets. Oh, right. So, I don't know. Is that a bit too much to expect? I don't know. Well, you look at the bottom here, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. The servants were summoned upstairs by a series of bells, each a different size to create a different tone, indicating which room needed attention. The servants' ears quickly became accustomed to the different bell tones, always alert to attend to the request from upstairs. The first up at 5am to complete her many jobs before the family rose was the housemaid. There could be two, the more senior called the lady's maid. She would open the shutters, clean and relay all the many fires. I don't think so. I mean, that's my understanding. It's pretty much original, so... Is this the entrance? This is a level up, isn't it? It is. It's cool. Certainly, mate, this is the way you would enter if you were posh. She's got her arms and carriages to come up. Yeah. In the Georgian house, the most important floor was the first floor. The rooms were ranked in orders of importance. The first floor front room or drawing room is the largest room in the house, and this is where the guests would arrive. The height of the room and the directions of the windows was important too. Is that original? Isn't it? Original? I'm not sure. No, it's screwed on, so probably not. It might have been, yeah. It was quite old. It was also where the guests would gather after dinner. The ladies first, followed later by the gentlemen. It was where the remainder of the evening would be spent. The dining room was a very important room. The family would always change for dinner, the butler assisting the man of the house and ladies made his wife. All hands on deck for dinner service as the kitchen and serving staff worked together to serve the family and their guests. The servants waiting at the table with the butler in charge of the wine and meat, whilst the gentlemen of the house would do the carving. Following main course, delicious desserts would be placed on dumb waiters. The family and guests would serve themselves. This is a very small little room. Is this William Rattray's library, where William continued to display his Jacobite sympathies? It is said he had portraits of the Stuart monarchs, he only revealed his private library to a select few friends. Whereas in the dining room, he had prints on display of George III, Princess Charlotte and Lord Cornwallis in an outward display of his Britishness. The columns in the hall are topped by a pediment, which was very popular inside of Georgian houses. The construction of the staircase was considered one of the Georgian builders' greatest skills. The stairs here has one end set in the wall, described as cantilever stairs, with a stone slab landings. The staircase was often the most conspicuous piece of craftsmanship in the building. In the late 18th century, handrails became the norm. William's house has magnificent high-quality wrought iron balustrades supported by mahogany handrail. This floor contains the principal bedrooms. Above the drawing room is William's bedroom. The wallpaper was brought back by William's older brother, James, the captain of an East Indiaman from China, along with a substantial number of Indian artefacts, 
to furnish his brother's home. The wallpaper has bamboo branches, various exotic birds on a green background. It is documented that originally the drawing room would have had exactly the same wallpaper. In the 17th century, European countries, principally the Dutch and British, for the first time were able to trade directly by sea with China. Chinese products like porcelain, lacquer and silk were admired for their deep colours, flawlessness, sheen and elegant designs, which could not be achieved by European manufacturers. There was widespread respect for the Chinese civilization. The image of China as an ancient, stable, wealthy, rational and virtuous society took hold. Contrasting with Europe and its near constant warfare and religious conflict. Employees of the East India Company, such as Captain James Rattray, were allowed to trade on their own account. Each crew member was allowed a certain amount of storage space. No doubt, as captain of the ship, James Rattray was allotted space according to his rank. Wallpaper was being developed as a cheaper but still smart alternative to tapestries. It is not known whether it was a European merchant or a Chinese manufacturer who came up with this new Chinese wallpaper product. It was from the very start both Chinese and European, a truly global product. It's very old, isn't it? Is it? Old India hands who returned to England with their fortunes came to be known as Nabobs, mm. In the 18th century, especially after Samuel Foote's 1779 play, the Nabob brought the term into general circulation. The word is corruption of the Hindustani Nawab, literally deputy, which was the title given by the Mughal emperors to their regional governors and viceroys. So William Rattray more than likely would have been called a Nabob, and possibly this reflects in the story about the grave when his body was exhumed, as mentioned earlier. In the rooms at the side, at the very top of the house, is likely where some of the staff would have had their accommodation. The housekeeper, butler and hard-working maids. The maids often worked up to 16 hours a day, six and a half days a week. Their pay would be around 10 to 12 pounds a year, which is equivalent of 7,500 to 9,000 today. And do you think the, his name's on the sundial? It says so. I'm going to have a look. It says William Rattray somewhere. There is writing here. I can't, uh, there is writing, but it's hard to decipher from. William Rattray was fond of the Rattray crest and legend and had it in cut and engraved or painted on every object, including silver plate, panels of the coach, the backs of high back chairs. I wonder where these objects are today. There were a number of pictures listed as being in William's possession at the time of his death, and these included portraits of Colonel Rattray's grandfather, James Rattray, 1636 to 1705, James Rattray of the Battle of Killiecrankie, as we call him, portraits of his grandmother, Anna Rattray, near Ney Durham, portraits of his mother, Elizabeth Jean Kinlock, two portraits of Captain James Rattray, the East India merchant, captain who sailed, sailed the East India men. Downey Park was eventually lost to the family in 1871 when it was sold to the Duke of Airlie for £28,000 to pay off debts of Captain James Rattray, Royal Navy.